I appreciate everyone being here. I hope that you will feel welcome. If you're visiting with us, hope you'll feel welcome and come back. And let us get acquainted with you further after services. Let's now open our Bibles to Acts chapter 9. We'll be looking in Acts chapter 9 and chapter 22 along with some other verses. But we'll mainly be focusing in on these two chapters in particular. Well, actually, while you're there in Acts 9, flip back a couple of chapters to chapter 7. I'd like us to notice what the Holy Spirit revealed about the conversion of Saul of Tarsus and what we can learn from that in a practical way for ourselves as we try to examine our own conversion. Uh, here is a test case. Here's a case of conversion I think the book of Acts can be looked at as, as uh, more or less uh, test or cases, uh, case law as we look at it in, in, uh, in modern vernacular. We look at uh, t- cases that have gone on before that they kind of set a precedent. And then we can judge the truth of that case and then judge from that our own case of conversion. What the New Testament is to us is an honors manual from the Holy Spirit, from Jesus Christ. The New Testament tells us how and why we need to be converted and how that takes place. And inasmuch as we want to be right with God, this particular case sets it out in a clear way how that conversion takes place. It helps us understand whether or not we are actually in good standing with God or whether we are somewhere outside of Jesus Christ knocking or anticipating coming in and haven't gotten there yet. And I hope that we have, but if we haven't, then we understand this particular case of conversion as it will help us. At the end of chapter 7, you remember that Saul was there at the... uh, the execution of Stephen, who proclaimed to them that they had the Jews in general had a history of being stubborn, and he called them uh, uncircumcised, stiff-necked in chapter 7, verse 51, uncircumcised in heart. That is, they were not open to listening to the Holy Spirit in the past by means of the prophets, and they had not been open to Jesus Christ, and therefore... Uh, They were not open now to his followers. And so he says, you have been resisting the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. You're still doing that. And Saul was among that crowd. In fact, at the end of that chapter, when Stephen knelt down, was stoned to death, chapter 8, verse 1 then says, now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout all the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And so the church is spreading as a result of this intense persecution that is going on in Jerusalem. And Saul is one of the instigators. Let's make note that Saul is a is a man of great conviction as a Jew. And in Philippians chapter 3, you remember the list of qualities that he had, that he says, I'm a Hebrew. If anybody was a Hebrew, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. And he talks about the credentials in his own religion as a Jew. Also in Galatians 2, he mentions that he had received this from his fathers and he had participated in that religion, and he had done so with great conviction. But Saul was wrong. Chapter 8, verse 3 also says that he made havoc of the church, entering every house, dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. That's how serious he was about his religion. He believed that the early church of Jesus Christ, he believed that this band of disciples, that they were heretics, that they were Jewish heretics. 
And according to the law of Moses, if you were a heretic, then you were to be executed. So he thought that he was doing the right thing. He was wrong, but he was sincerely wrong. So that brings us then to the first point I would like to make about a lesson from Saul is that you can be a religious person and you can believe in God, but you can still be wrong, sincere but wrong. This is what we see in him. In fact, after his conversion, he writes 13 of the books of the New Testament, one of which is Romans. And then I'd like you to notice a statement that he makes about his own countrymen, which reflect about, uh, on him before his conversion. I'm looking at Romans chapter 10. I'd like you to notice verses 1 through 4. Because this was his own condition before, and now, he's, now he's, his heart is breaking because he now sees the light, and he understands that his own countrymen were in the condition he was himself in. Looking in Romans 10, verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. I would love that. I want them to be saved. I'm praying that they would be. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. But you see, it was a misguided zeal. They have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Mix knowledge with zeal and you've got something. But if you just got zeal like Paul Saul had previously, then it's misguided zeal. It was leading him to persecute the church. But it was zeal that was driving him to that. But it was knowledge that then changed his direction and then attached some, some guidelines, some direction to that zeal. Well, he says, they being ignorant of God's righteousness, that is God's way of making men right, they are ignorant of that. And he himself had been ignorant of that previously. And seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. The way God would make people right, they haven't submitted to that. And then he concludes verse 4 on that point, for Christ is the end of the law. It, and that means he's the objective end. The law had in mind getting us to this end, getting us to Jesus Christ. And so Christ is what the law was about, preparing us to accept Jesus. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. But his own countrymen are in the situation he was in. Now, he was had a zeal. Let's go back now to our text. And I'm looking in chapter 9 now where the Holy Spirit gives us the record of his conversion. And how the circumstances uh, brought that about. Let's note. Then Saul... Still breathing threats. He hasn't been converted yet to Christ. He still has a zeal for God. But he's threatening and murdering the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus. I want to go up to the north area of the country. To the synagogues of Damascus. And he's getting permission from the high priest to, to carry out this serious uh, situation of trying to uh, capture and, and uh, persecute more Christians. So he says, if I find any who are of the way, understand that there is only one way. And he says, if I, uh, and that's Luke telling us that, he was saying, if I find any who are of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. But something happened as he was journeying up there. Verse 3. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul. 
Saul, why are you persecuting me? I'm sure that this was very surprising. This is not an everyday occurrence. This didn't happen in every case of conversion. Lights don't come down and shine in every case of conversion. Not that way. But in this particular case, the Lord was making Saul a test case himself. And he asked him, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now, Jesus was in heaven. But it was his disciples who represented Jesus Christ that Saul was persecuting. And so God takes, Jesus takes that personally. When you persecute his disciples, you're persecuting Jesus as far as he's concerned. And then he makes this point. He says, it is hard for you to kick against the goads or pricks as some versions say. And what a goad was, was a cattle prod. It would kind of goad the cattle to go in a certain direction. If he's not going that way, then you stick him and make him go that direction. Well, in essence, this is what Ecclesiastes 12 talks about when he talks about the prophetic word that they're like wise sayings, that they're like goads that prod people on. And, and if you looked at the Old Testament scriptures, they talked about Jesus in prophetic ways before he got here, before he came. And so what it was doing was kind of prodding people to be aware of who the Messiah was, was and who it was. Uh, what he would be like, where he would be born, and, and what his mission was. All those things were prods. But what Saul had been doing was kicking against those things. Instead of listening to those goading prophecies that talked about the Messiah, he was kicking and resisting it. He says, that's hard for you to do. You, you've been kicking against the goads. So, verse 6, so he, trembling, I mean, this was a wake-up call, trembling and astonished, I mean, this surprise, I've been wrong. Astonished, said, Lord. Now, here's the first confession of Saul. He calls him Lord. Lord, what do you want me to do? Now, remember this. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but whoever does the will of my Father. So there's more to it than just confessing that Jesus is the Lord. So what we have then in this particular case Saul being in the same condition as the Jews who had, entered, uh, who had not entered into union with Christ. Now he wants to be in union with Christ. What do you want me to do? Remember, he is a high-ranking Jew, but he's a lost Jew. It doesn't matter how religious and how, how much zeal a person has. If he doesn't have Jesus Christ, he is still lost. Jesus is the answer to the sin problem, and all have sinned, including Saul. He doesn't have the blood of Christ. All he has is his life compared to the law of Moses. And the law of Moses says, you have sinned. So his credentials were high. He was probably one of the highest ranking of Jews, but he was still a lost Jew. Because he was without the blood of Jesus Christ. And of course, sin is what condemns us. Because we've all sinned, we're condemned by sin. So he is religious, but he's wrong. And let's make, make this very clear. He is not saved by this vision. Oh, the vision prods him toward salvation. It is another one of the goads. 
But he's not saved just because he had this vision and he says, Lord. Because he says, Lord, what do you want me to do? So he's not saved at that very moment. And since he believes Jesus in saying, I am Jesus whom you crucified, and he now believes that, and he calls him Lord, he's still not saved yet. It's not at the moment of faith alone. He is to be told what he must do. Remember Jesus had commissioned his disciples saying, Go preach the gospel, the good news to every creature. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark 16, 15 and 16. So he's going to be told what he must do. Notice verse 9. And he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. You remember fasting is because of mourning. Doing without food is because you are in a mournful situation. He is fasting for three days, not because he's happy to be saved, because he's not saved. He hasn't been told yet what he must do. So he's fasting because he has faith, but it is not the faith yet that will bring him into union with Christ. We'll have to understand when and how that happens in faith. But he neither ate nor drank, and it says that he was in this condition for three days waiting for somebody to come and tell him what he must do. So not even the, during the three days of fasting do we have a man who understands he's saved and therefore should be rejoicing. He's not rejoicing. He has nothing yet to rejoice about because he is not saved by faith alone. Saved people are people like the Ethiopian eunuch who came up out of the water and then he went on his way rejoicing, Acts chapter 8 talks about. When you are saved, you rejoice. When you are lost, you are mourning and you're seeking to be forgiven of your sins. Saul was not yet celebrating his salvation because he is not yet in a saved condition. At understanding then that he was religious but wrong and he understands now that I was wrong, he's still waiting for someone to tell him what he must do. Verse 6. Now, as he's waiting... Luke doesn't tell us all the details in this particular case. So we're going to look in Acts chapter 22, holding your place in Acts chapter 9. We want to hear from Paul about what he understood about his conversion and when it took place. So in Acts chapter 22, he is rehearsing what happened to him. Acts 22, therefore, is more detail about the moment of his salvation. See, he's praying for three days and he's fasting because he's in a mournful state. He recognizes, I've been wrong about persecuting these Christians. I've been terribly wrong. And now he understands somebody's got to tell me what to do. Well, in Acts chapter 22, he's rehearsing this situation. Verse 7, he says, I, he talked about the fact that I was journeyed. Verse 6, I journeyed. I came near Damascus. A great light from heaven shone around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Verse 7. Verse 8, so I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me indeed saw the light. And were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. So I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, arise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all things which are appointed for you to do. 
said, Since I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came into Damascus. Then one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me, and he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour, I looked at, up at him, and he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will, and see the just one, and hear the voice of his mouth, for you will be his witness to all men who, uh, of what all you have seen and heard. And now notice the clincher, verse 16. And now, why are you waiting? You've been waiting for three days. Why, what are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized. You got the belief part in place. You've corrected you, you've got your mind corrected in regard to which way you ought to go. But here's the thing that you've been waiting to hear. I want you to arise and be baptized. Two things are going to come out of that. Wash away your sins. You still have them. Notice that he's not saved because he still has his sins. But if he would arise and be baptized and wash away his sins, then he would be calling on the name of the Lord to save him from those sins. Those are the things that would be seen in this action that is described as baptism. So what must he do? You'll be told, and Ananias says, well, here's what you do. Now, at this point, he's already believed in the Lord. He's shown... uh, evidence of repentance that he's sorry, a godly sorrow is working on him, but now he is at the precipice of having his sins washed away, and here is the moment when it takes place. And note, keep in mind, before he does this, he is still in his sins. Now you would think with a vision People today say, well, I had a vision and the Lord saved me at that moment. No, that's not the way it ever operated in those test cases we see in the New Testament. Yes, Saul was a special case who saw this light, but he still wasn't saved by the vision. And he wasn't saved just because he believed that Jesus is the Lord. And he wasn't saved just because he was sorry for his sins. There is still something that he must do. Now, let's understand Paul as he understands baptism in its proper role. He writes the book of Romans, and the book of Romans talks about salvation, and it even talks about the moment of salvation. Now, look in chapter 6 of Romans. I'm looking at verse 1. Romans chapter 6 verse 1 says to the brethren, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Grace is not for the purpose of allowing you to continue in sin. So shall we continue in sin and just kind of uh, trust that the grace of God is just going to automatically take care of all of that? He says certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Living in sin is not what a Christian can do. Because you died to sin. Something inside you died to the love of it and to the practice of it. Do you, or, or do you not know, verse 3 says, That as many of us, listen to him talk about his own conversion here, as many of us as were baptized into Christ, what does he understand about his baptism? Well, he understands that he was baptized into union with Christ. Listen very carefully. We were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death. How do I benefit from his death? Up to this moment, he had not benefited from Jesus' death. 
But at this precise moment, this is the moment when he is baptized into the death of Jesus Christ. Therefore, verse 4, we, talking about himself and everybody else who is a Christian, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. When did Paul have this newness of life? It was not when he was praying for three days. It was not when he had the vision on the road. It was not the moment when he said, Lord, what would you have me to do? It was the moment when Ananias said, what are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Then you can have newness of life. So what happens in baptism? Well, scriptural baptism, I recognize that there are perversions of baptism. But scriptural baptism is, is more than just dunking the body in water. There's something going on in the mind and the heart. And if it's not going on in the mind and the heart, you're not baptized into union with Christ. You can dunk a body. I remember when I was quite young, playing in the lake with my older brother, uh, that he said, I'm, I'm going to baptize you. And he dunked me down in the water. And I would come up just kind of sputtering and trying to get my breath and was I baptized? Well, in a technical sense, you are immersed. But there was nothing going on in my heart. I was not dying to sin. And so when he was burying me that way, that was not baptism into Jesus Christ. Something has to be united together in this action. And, and that's why you don't dunk babies that don't have these convictions. You don't dunk people just to dunk them or some kind of initiation right. One has to first be convicted of sin, which Saul was. And he's dying to sin, which Saul was. And he is buried with Christ in faith. He is buried, he's going down into this grave with Christ and notice the next thing that he says in Romans chapter 4, or chapter 6, verse 5. For if we have been united together, see he wasn't united together before, but if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, so we know when he was united together was when he was baptized if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also should be in the likeness of his resurrection. So we go down and we are united with Jesus Christ and we're buried with Jesus Christ and then we are raised with Jesus Christ. And we do that so that we can start living the new life. We walk in newness of life. That's when we are asking the Lord to please forgive us of our sins. We're calling on the Lord. That's why Adam and I said, what are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So sins are washed away at this moment. Not before, but at this moment. In Acts chapter 2 verse 38, the 3,000 said, what shall we do? Peter said, Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Sins are washed away at this precise moment. So what do we learn? We learn from Saul's conver conversion that salvation is indeed by the grace of God, but it is not by grace alone. Let me, let me explain that. If it is by grace alone, and the Lord says, I would have all men to be saved, then if it's by grace alone, then everybody would be saved. 
But everybody is not going to be saved because it's not by grace alone. God has some conditions. And it is not by faith. It is by faith, but it's not by faith alone. See, he had faith. But he had to be baptized. The truth changed his mission. So I'm turning back again to Rome, uh, Acts chapter 9. And I'd like you to notice what happens after he was baptized. Looking in Acts chapter 9, look at verse 20. Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Before he was totally against that. The truth changed his mind. It changed his life and it changed his mission in life. And so now he's preaching in the synagogue. Jesus is the Son of God. That's what truth does. It changes your life. It changes your mission in life. He fought the truth before. Now he's preaching the truth about Jesus Christ. And notice verse 22. But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews. Now he's working to convert his fellow Jews. But he's confounding the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. The truth changed the way he even handled the scriptures. So in this case of conversion, you take a totally different view of the Old Testament. The Old Testament then becomes a lie because you see how it is fulfilled in Jesus. So now he's proving that Jesus is the Christ by taking the Jews' own scriptures, which is our Old Testament. He takes those very scriptures and he proves what once he fought. He was not seeing Jesus at all in the prophetic word. Now he sees him. I like the way Peter frames it in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. He says, but we have the prophetic word made more sure. We do. We Christians do. Why? Because the prophetic word is fulfilled in Jesus and we see that. And the more we look at it, the more evident it is that Jesus is the Christ. And the morning star rises in our hearts. It, there's a dawning upon us. There is a light that clicks on. We begin to see things in a different way. We see the Old Testament come alive and fit Jesus perfectly. And that's because the Holy Spirit revealed it. It wasn't the product of human wisdom. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, he talks about being spiritually blind and then how that the gospel then revealed Jesus Christ to us. And in that way then... The truth changed the way you handle the scriptures. You take the scriptures and you use them. If you are converted, the most important thing you possess is the scriptures. If you have converted to Jesus Christ, you are always studying the scriptures. They are very important to you because you will handle them and you will see them in a greater light. So he moves from not seeing who Jesus is from that Old Testament to becoming a dead book to a, becoming a very much alive book. From light rising in his heart. He had experienced it from the outside when God woke him up with that light from the outside. But he went to the street called straight and got straightened out. Have you been united with Christ in baptism? Well, that can only take place if you believe and you've looked at the evidence and you're coming to the conviction that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And then if you've been repentant of your sin and sorrowful in a godly way toward God and about your sin, then you can be baptized. What would you be waiting for? His case in conversion awakens us to the moment of salvation. It's right within reach of anyone who believes Jesus is the Christ. If we can help you in your obedience to the gospel this morning, please come and let